Justin Weinberg, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. So uh, welcome to everyone at uh, Meaning of Life TV, part of the bloggingheads.tv network. Uh, this is the SOFIA program. Uh, I am Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be joined by Justin Weinberg, who is, is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina, um, specializes in ethics, political philosophy, also editor of the Daily News, um, which uh, I'm going to ask you to describe, uh, Justin, but suffice it to say, it's one of a, a handful of pretty major online players within the philosophy profession. But maybe you could characterize how you see the Daily News in, in, in the context of professional philosophy. Sure. Well, it's sort of like an informal trade journal for philosophy. So its target audience is philosophy professors, philosophy grad students, maybe philosophy undergrads, people interested in what's going on in the professional world of philosophy or what professional philosophers are concerned about. And it presents various news items, things like who's won what grant when, uh, whether people have changed jobs, whether certain topics are being thought of as important, uh, whether there's some uh, interesting new project or some grant or some public outreach that is worth bringing attention to everyone else. It uh, covers news items like that and provides a forum for people to discuss these matters. Do you, do you keep any sort of demographics? Do you, have, do you actually know who's, re who's reading, what they, how they break down sort of the number, percentage of you know, students versus professors versus people who are not in philosophy at all who are just sort of interested, or, or do you not really know that? I have not taken any measures to figure that out, um, to do that. I, I, don't, I don't know who's visiting my site. I don't have, uh, perhaps there's a way for me to identify the addresses of all the people who come visit my site, but I don't know what that would be, and I never looked into that. Uh, so I don't know who's visiting my site in particular. And I uh, assume, though, that it's largely philosophy professors and philosophy graduate students, in part because it got started via uh, my networking it to various philosophy professors and philosophy students, and that's yeah. where its core audience began. Yeah, the focus on sort of sort of inside baseball, I guess you can presume, would mostly appeal to. But you do have a lot of substantive content. I mean, it's not just it's not just sort of the insider goings on. I mean, you do post quite a bit on sort of substantive topics that I guess are trending um, in terms of the discourse, right? That's true. So um, when it comes to substantive philosophy, I think that the subject area that gets the most attention of daily news is meta philosophy is what it is we're up to when we're doing philosophy which of course is a, a natural concern and a matter of curiosity for a lot of philosophers um, apart from that we deal with substantive issues regarding questions about diversity in the profession or what things people should be teaching um, and, and you know, matters like that. But when it comes to substantive philosophy, there's not a whole lot that's done in depth there, apart generally from you know, metaphilosophical questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll get to this probably a little, little later when we talk about sort of um, the, the online presence of philosophy. Um, but it does seem to me that one of the things that you do is that um, things that are trending, topics of discussion that are trending in the social media universe of professional philosophy you tend to, to pick up on and sort of at least, if not participate in, link to it and maybe have a descriptive. So, so, so you sort of, you, you've got your ear to sort of what people are talk, in the discipline are talking about, not just within their professional, i.e. academic peer-reviewed work, but also what's going on in the informal discussion. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I try to keep track of, of what people are interested in. Uh, I have a presence on, a personal presence on social media and I get exposed to the kinds of professional issues that a lot of philosophers are thinking about or discussing. When it comes to their latest work, a lot of people share their, their substantive philosophical work online and social media as well. But normally, the, that material, journal articles and so on, normally that's going to be of interest to other people working in that area of specialization. So they don't provide usually as much 
source material for the blog has these more general concerns. And actually, that's a really great segue into the first thing I wanted to talk about. I, I think one of the things that people, the general public, don't know, and I'm I'm not even just limiting my my point to the sort of the educate college educated general public, um, is what um, what's the difference between what goes on in a typical philosophy classroom um, that an undergraduate might take as part of a general education requirement, let's say. Um, or even, let's say, uh, you know, an undergraduate philosophy major um, who's taking, let's say, upper division survey courses or whatever. Um, how, what's, different between, what's different between what goes on in an, in an average college classroom and what philosophers do when they're doing professional research? Because I think people really don't know what research in philosophy could possibly consist of. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between what we do as teachers and what we do as researchers. And now let's leave out graduate school teaching. Right. That's I, right. I, th I think you're right that a lot of people don't understand what philosophy professors are up to when they do research and, and either don't understand or are uncomfortable with or even deny this idea of philosophical expertise. Uh, and... It is different what philosophers do in their own research than what goes on in the classroom. I take it that what goes on in the classroom, particularly at the introductory level, is we're trying to get students to be thoughtful. So our teaching is geared towards a certain, certain ways of doing that, uh, in part by having them question things that they've long taken for granted. It's a very common understanding of what philosophy is. A lot of times people don't understand that things that everyone thinks, we can put a question mark at the end of that and look into it. And so we have them identify latent beliefs and ideas in our culture and our society and our mental lives. And we teach them how to raise thoughtful questions about them, to think carefully, make distinctions as need be, and to try to articulate more well-considered views. In that sense, right, that skill set's a very basic skill set regarding various questions about us, our nature, our place in the world, our self-understanding, that those, and those kinds of questions and those skills are something that could, anyone can start off doing, that everyone can ask questions, but philosophy professors are really good at that and really good at showing students how to do that. So in that sense, at that introductory level, there's a sense in which philosophy is something that I think is kind of familiar um, to the broader public. We're asking questions, uh, teaching people how to think carefully to raise questions. At the more refined level, philosophical research, well, um, if you think of philosophy as, in part, a kind of conversation, right? either you're putting your ideas out there in either in, in contact with other ideas that you can imagine or, or other people in started off as, you know, we have Plato's dialogues as a, as a model for a philosophy as a conversation. Well, people have been talking about these ideas for a really long time, for various, you know, various versions of these ideas for a really long time. And one of the things that you get through a more sustained philosophical education is exposure to a lot of what's been written on various topics and understanding where the conversation is preceded. If you take any topic, leave philosophy aside, maybe you like rock and roll or jazz or art or something like that, anything that you know a lot about, okay, that you've talked about, and you compare the kind of conversations you can have with an enthusiast about that subject compared to the kinds of conversations you could have to someone who has just heard their first tune of that type, right? right. Um, right. You can just have much more sophisticated kinds of conversations because the this, this shared... Uh, knowledge you have with the other experts is more in depth, more in detail, more informed, and further along down the road. Questions that are novel to a beginner might be old hat to an expert. For the experts, keep answering, keep looking into various questions and raise new questions, questions that wouldn't make sense to someone who's just starting out uh, because they're so far down the path of inquiry. Could you give so, it a can you think of easily, like handily, like an example of a question 
both in its first incarnation and then in its second, that sort of might give people sort of an illustration. I don't know why I was thinking that something epistemic might be useful, but but what, anything that come to mind for you that um, could indicate the two different levels of the same concept or the same question? Um, one of my favorite family of examples comes from metaethics, which is, for your audience, the st studies about how how we can know anything about right and wrong and what the ideas of right and wrong refer to. So the metaphysics and epistemology of ethics. People are often struck by a certain kind of metaphilosophical question, which is something like, is morality real? Mm. Like, is there something out there or are we just making this stuff up? Okay, and that's a basic metaethical question. If you look at any metaethics textbook or work, um, many of them have these wonderful flowcharts that start off with a version of that question. Usually it's something like, are moral judgments intended to be true? Right? Or do moral judgments refer to something outside one's mind? Something along those lines. So it's, it's, it's already where like a slightly more rare, you know, sophisticated version of the initial question. And then it goes through and asks various questions. So do our moral judgments intended to be true? Well, some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, if they are intended to be true, in virtue of what are they true? Are they true in, in virtue of some fact about the world? If so, what fact? Is it a natural fact, a non-natural fact, right? If it's a natural fact, what is that fact, right? and so on down that road. If it's, you know, if, if we go back up the branch and say no, then we have a whole bunch of other kinds of questions. And so you can see within these relatively simple positions, various versions is what you're sort of saying that, that have, new, have a nuance that the initial distinction doesn't have. That's right. You, you start off with one basic general question and you'll end up actually with a hundred different questions. And one of the things that philosophers I think are experts at are showing where those questions are, coming up with them or discovering them, however you want to understand that to be, uh, identifying these, these further questions, showing us in more detail and more specifically what it is exactly we don't quite know yet. Do you think, do you think there's an answer? Um, well, in answer to what, I think, is the – in answer to, to all of our philosophical well, so, so, so you know, you sort of what you just described is really I, sort of sort of interesting, and I, I've actually been thinking about this a lot. Um, and I've got a paint essay coming out in philosophy now, which for people who don't know, it's sort of a, one of a number of popularizing magazines that attempts to bring some some relatively sophisticated philosophy to general uh, general low educated audiences. Where I'm sort of talking about this, but the picture you just described, we start off with an in, initial kind of distinction, you know. Uh, you know, eth with, let's say ethics, you know, um, 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 are they intended to be true or false in the sense that is there some fact of the matter that they correspond to or do they just sort of reflect our own preferences, uh, 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 et cetera? And um, you said, well, then, then you ask that, and then the more sophisticated conversation starts to sort of ask questions within each of those positions that then sort of shows you that there's a lot of versions of those positions. And I guess what I'm wondering is, is that a process that goes on ad infinitum or is that a process that terminates at some point? Um, in other words, is there going to be an answer? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the version that survives all the investigation. And now we can put that to bed, you know, just like, you know, uh, like, like a scientist might put a question to bed. That's pretty well settled. Right. Um, or is it, is it not that kind of question? I think it remains to be seen if that's a, a bit of a cheat of an answer. Well, it's not a cheat at all. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> I think that um, I like uh, I like the following idea of what we're doing when we're doing philosophy. It's not the only way to describe what we're doing when we do philosophy, but uh, if if you think of of what philosophers are doing as making a map of sorts, right? Um, the map consists of various areas, right, with specific features or topics within those areas. And about each of those topics, we can ask bigger and smaller questions. And what we can 
do is make various distinctions that help us form possible answers to those questions. So here's a, there might be a question about the nature of morality, like, uh, well, if moral judgments are intended to be true, are any of them in fact true, right? Uh, one possible answer is yes, one possible answer is no, right? Um, so we've, we've done some mapping right there. We've shown here's a question, and here are two roads for further inquiry. And philosophy, the whole collective enterprise, could be seen as this map-making enterprise where we identify questions, topic, topics, questions, and then various possible answers. Now, uh, I think that's an enormous intellectual contribution right? because what it's doing is, in a way, cataloging or discovering or creating um, a body of knowledge about what it is we don't know. Um, or what it is we can ask about. Uh, so if we think that um, learning is important, that knowledge is important, uh, if we're mapping out various open questions that need answering or addressing or inquiring, whether in philosophy or maybe we parcel that to another discipline, um, we are providing a valuable intellectual service there. Uh, now someone might come back and say, are any of these routes, you know, um, better than the others, right? If we're mapping out the possible routes, we're like checking for logical coherence and things like that. Um, how can we, can we figure out which road to take? So to speak, which is the right one? Uh, and I think a lot of questions about, you know, what are we doing when we do philosophy? Are we ever going to come to some kind of answer are, are asking that. Uh, and I think the answer to that question is, is, is difficult in part is because it depends. Yeah. I'm of the view that we certainly can make certain, um, we can pick certain answers rather than others when it comes to various small questions. Uh, in this, I follow uh, this philosopher uh, at, uh, I believe at ANU, uh, Daniel Stoljar. He has this really interesting view that we can understand, uh, we can sort of classify, I mean, there are lots of different ways to classify philosophy questions, but you know, a small, large, and topical. And we have answers to small questions. Here's an example of a small question. Does so-and-so's theory commit a fallacy of this type? It does or doesn't? When we can figure that out, right? Or, so, so, so we do have answers to some little philosophical questions. It usually doesn't satisfy the, the person who's asking, are we really getting philosophical questions? Because they're not asking about, does so-and-so's theory commit some fallacy? They want to know, you know, what's the relationship between the mind and the body or something like that. Uh, and Stolzer says, well, look, there, there are those, those huge questions, like what's the relationship between the mind and the body, but those are more topic-setting questions. Than, and it might be that we don't yet have definitive answers to them, but that doesn't show us that we can't make other kinds of progress by answering these, these questions in the middle, these middle-sized questions. Yeah. Uh, and so one of, one of his examples of this is, well, his way of doing this is to show that we've come up with better ways to ask certain questions. So he, he goes through Descartes' version of asking about the mind-body problem, points out that it relies on certain mistaken conceptions of what matter is that uh, are crucial to his argument. Right. And then says, so we don't ask it. We really don't ask Descartes' version of the question anymore. And he contrasts that with uh, um, Jackson's version, Frank Jackson's version of the question, which is, is, is a different kind of question. It's like, these are about the same general topic, but they're different. And it's a form of progress because we've learned that this is not the right way to ask this. This is. Right, right. You know, right. If I can say one more thing, though. It, so we would say, but still, what about this big mind-body problem or the nature of ethics, right? What about that? We don't have an answer to that. Do we think that philosophy will ever have an answer to that? And if no, what's the point? And I think a, a useful analogy is something like biology. We might not know in, in philosophy how the mind interacts with the body or what the mind is or something like that. But in biology, they don't really know exactly how the body works. How the body works is still an open question in biology. Right? They're all new, dis new discoveries every month about how the body works. Um, two striking ones um, recently. One is it was just last year that scientists discovered that the lungs play a role in making blood, like a really, really important role in manufacturing blood, something along the lines of what bone marrow does, 
right? Just last year. It's not like lungs or some new discovery or that we haven't been cutting these things right. up for hundreds. You know, we, we're pretty familiar. And still, making blood is pretty important. We've learned that. Um, another example is our microbiome, right? Uh, all the microorganisms that live within us that make up a substantial amount of our body mass um, but are not of human DNA apparently affect our well-being in all sorts of ways that are just being discovered. Um, so this biologists don't have an answer to the question, how does the body work? They're still working on it, right? But we wouldn't think that just because there's this huge open question, how does the body work, when biologists make progress on smaller questions, they're not making progress. They are, right? Likewise, if we can make progress on some of the smaller questions, we too are making progress, even if some of you know, these topics remain as topics of inquiry. Yeah. 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 You know, my own, my own feelings about this are still not entirely formed. I, I, I am starting to get the suspicion, however, that the kinds of problems we address are very different from the biological sort that there is in the case of the biological question, a reasonable expectation that because there is some fact of the matter as to how the thing actually works, that, you know, if we have the ability to discover, you know, what it does in total, we eventually will. Um, but that the philosophical questions I'm increasingly inclined to think uh, are not those kinds. And part of the reason I think that is that it's not, it's not just the perennial quality of the questions, but it's that the position, first of all, pretty much every position that's in that map that you described uh, is held by a pretty credible uh, or more than one credible person. I mean, you know, just take realists and anti-realists, right? Um, um, uh, you know, Nelson Goodman is no less credible a philosopher than uh, than, than than any other, right? Um, and yet he has, you know, what would be deemed a, a pretty radical view uh, about about the f fundamental nature of reality. And you can just sort of sort of run that down the line. Um, so, so for one thing, there are pretty much people represented, very credible people represented across the map of positions that you're describing, and that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Um, um, there have been anti-realists going back to Berkeley and before that, right? I mean, in the, in the sense that, that, that we're talking about. And secondly, what look like improvements sometimes turn out not to be, and you wind up having revivals, right? So, for example, take the case of ethics, right? Um, you know, there was a pretty distinctive shift in the modern era away from the, 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 the classical paradigm uh, of virtue, of, ver of the way of thinking of ethics in, primarily in terms of virtues. And it was a very powerful uh, new paradigm, the paradigm that we would, you know, roughly uh, assign, uh, associate with deontologists and, you, and, and consequentialists. But then, you know, by the late 20th century, um, there were some very, very well considered serious criticisms to the two most uh, apparently uh, that I can think of are, you know, th that of Anscombe and McIntyre that mm -hmm. pretty much almost single-handedly uh, revived interest in virtue ethics and actually gave the impression that, you know, it's not obvious actually that this whole modern diversion was really an improvement after all, right? And so when I start looking at a situation like that, I start thinking, you know, we're mistaken in thinking that these are the kinds of questions that we think they are, maybe partly because we're being misled by the surface grammar of the questions, right? You know, this is sort of a Wittgensteinian analysis, um, that we're really engaged in a very different sort of business, which is why I'm starting to think, and I'm going to get off my box in a second, I want to hear what you think about this, but which is why I'm, I'm starting to think that there's actually kind of a curve like this in the usefulness of philosophical investigation. The initial foray into the question is really interesting, it's really interesting to see what the map kind of looks like, what the various versions of this could be. But then the sort of grinding effort afterwards to just keep going on and on and publishing more and more and more to try assumes that there's some endpoint, but there isn't one, right? And so it actually, then you get diminishing returns. So I'm thinking of something like the discussion of like Gettier cases, right? Um, um, really interesting at the beginning, interesting to map out what the possible ways of looking at this are. But once you start acting like you're trying to solve a problem like it's in biology, it becomes uninteresting, and it just sort of keeps going and going until finally someone like someone puts a, puts puts a, puts a knife in it. You know, um, Susan Hack disparagingly referred to recurring uh, bouts of galloping gettyeritis, right? As sort of these recurs. So that's how I'm starting to feel about this now. And I wonder if 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 if, if maybe we have a mistaken conception of what it is we're doing when we do our research. Right. Well, I will 
don't want to take our patients with or boredom or frustration with certain forms of inquiry as any kind, as much evidence that um, that they're fruitless, that they're fruitless, or that we're not going to come to some interesting result at the end of them. I mean, we're creatures of a certain type that need stimulation of a certain type, and if you've been reading epistemology for 20 years, and for 10 years of that, all you've been reading is stuff about getting your cases, you're going to get bored, and you're going to be in a cohort of other people who have gotten bored, and all of you are going to come to, we want to talk about something else. Um, that, that, that we're tired of talking about it doesn't mean that there's not more work that right. could be done on yeah. it. Yeah. That, that said, I, I, I do think um, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that there's a difference between kinds of uh, questions philosophers raise and the kinds of questions that, that scientists uh, raise and uh, attempt to answer. Um, I will say that a lot of the argumentative work defending certain views, I think is a way of, is it, you can understand that as a way of trying to say, of, of people fighting over which is the right answer, right? And, and, and I think a lot of people take themselves to be doing that. But I think if you look at it from the perspective, sort of an observer perspective of what's going on in philosophy, you could sort of see it as an argument for why this view should stay on the map as a coherent possible route, right? And insofar as we think that, that having that map is useful, these attempts to defend one view or another, or criticize one view or another, it, are attempts to get the map right. Uh, yeah. And, and I, like, I like the view of getting the map right better than, well, if we just wait long enough and do enough writing, we'll eventually figure out who was right, Goodman or, or your favorite realist, right? I don't see that ever happening, right? Well, okay, so, so here's this other question, though. Uh, some people say that, uh, or some people observe that in some ways the topic area of philosophy has gotten narrower. So in ancient times you had philosophers saying, okay, there are four elements uh, that the, everything is made out of. And, uh, and then, oh, that was one thing. And it, so uh, philosophers normally aren't talking nowadays about you know, what the elements are. Uh, we've shipped that out. Yeah, you shift other things out to psychologists, other things out to maybe economics and other fields like that. Um, and we can ask, does, how are we supposed to understand uh, this idea? I think uh, um, Chalmers calls this disciplinary speciation, where certain questions peel off from philosophy and uh, either start or become integrated into other disciplines. Mm. Uh, is, yeah. is, it, is, is that a form of philosophical progress where we've come to the point where we've realized here are the questions, we've done what we can do, and now we've learned maybe as a culture uh, that there's a way we can start trying to tackle these questions and it becomes a science or another form of inquiry. Right? Uh, to the extent to which philosophy contributes to that process, is that count as philosophy's progress? That's interesting. So what you're suggesting maybe in response to me is that, hey, you're being, mis you, me, being me, are being misled by the fact that the questions that are remaining are the ones that are resisting speciation, right? In other, in other words, yeah. I see, yeah, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting reply. I have to think about that, that's, but that's an interesting reply that in a sense, oh no, lots of things have been settled. They've been handed off to the, to the, the physicist, the biologist, the chemist, the psychologist, etc., and your impression of the lack of progress or, or whatever you want to call it is that you're focusing on the questions that have stayed, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And, um, and, and whether we call that philosophy's progress or not is kind of more labeling than anything else. Yeah, it doesn't I think that the underlying phenomenon is there where there are questions that philosophers have come across, identified, clarified, um, and then these questions have been taken up by other disciplines, then, and that's happening. Yeah. Whether we want to call philosophy's progress or just intellectual progress more generally. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and um, um, let's just um, talk a little bit um, because, look, as two philosophers, we could talk pretty much about anything. But, I mean, the reason I really wanted to have you on in particular is, is because you are connected in a way with the profession that, 
a lot of people, other professors simply aren't, by virtue of the blog that you host, um, um, which 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 has has quite a quite a bit of uh, influence and, and and reach in the sense that a lot of people are reading it who are in the profession, and um, and you're pre you're really you really sort of keep up with what's going on in a very uh, contemporary fashion. Maybe you could describe for the audience your and I understand this is your impression. Um, your impression of, to the extent to which there is an institutional framework within professional philosophy, what is it? How do you see it? Uh, is it formal? Is it is it a, is it a, you know is it just the APA, um, um, or is it are there are there is there more to it than that? To what extent is there a formal professional infrastructure in but philosophy first, discipline? I think first and foremost are the universities and the shared practices among the universities, right? So there's graduate education, there's getting a PhD, there's the practice that generally you need a PhD to become a professor, a member of the profession, and that way um, that a PhD consists in a project of a certain kind, either one long work or now more and more several shorter works bundled together in a certain way. Um, and also the shared practice of sending people's work around for tenure to other you know, to, to philosophers elsewhere for promotion, uh, the shared institutions of the journals uh, and the and book publishers as well, where we're mutually checking in on each other's work. So there's there's all of that. The um, common professional guess, academic uh, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so, 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 so I, I think that does a, a lot of work in terms of informing individual members of the profession what it is that they're supposed to do and what the expectations for them are. I mean, that takes up most of people's, uh, I, I, think, I think that answers most of people's questions. Well, what am I supposed to be doing? Oh, I'm supposed to be writing. I'm supposed to be sending my stuff out. I'm supposed to be you know, dealing with questions that other people are talking about, uh, making contributions to the university and those kinds of things. So I think that's, that, that's most of it. Um, and then... But I guess I think you're, you're probably asking more about philosophy-specific non-university. Yeah, to what, to what extent do we have an association like, let's say, the American Psychological Association? To what extent do we have an infrastructure that some of the natural sciences have? Um, um, uh, or is philosophy more informally uh, constituted as a, as, a, as a discipline? Well, I mean, there's the APA, right? Uh, and... The APA has its three branches, and it has uh, officers of each, uh, where and usually the past officers, the past presidents, are given various honorifics that they can they can speak. Uh, so moving up through service ranks through serving the APA is another way in which the uh, the profession is structured in a certain way, uh, and there are various awards and other forms of recognition that the APA. What does the APA do? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I think that question would probably be um, best. You, you, at some point, you should probably have uh, an officer of the APA or an executive director yes. of the APA. I, I'm th uh, this is your impressions as of somebody who is watching yeah. pretty closely the business. And so. Okay, so, so one of the things that the APA does is uh, it provides common gathering places for philosophers to get Meeting together. That are uh, regional, pretty large, much. Yeah. yeah, right. Meeting face-to-face, -face, right? And at these meetings, um, through the program committees, you have some kind of, uh, you get some kind of impression about what topics are important, right? The program committee has to figure out if they're going to have any special sessions on any particular topics, if they're going to have any author meets critic sessions on particular books, and then, of course, they have to make decisions about which submitted papers get accepted, right? These are all judgment calls about what counts as good philosophy, what counts as interesting topics, what counts as new developments that are worth exploring. And they also have various sessions on professional matters. Uh, so uh, two years ago, I was part of a panel on funding in philosophy that uh, was put on. And it, you know, this is not substantive philosophy, but it had to do with the nature of funding for various projects. Uh, and so those professional issues come up uh, as well at APA. So I think uh, it, it's a way of recognizing various substantively philosophical and also professional matters of interest. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, and then also recognizing good philosophical work, either you know, by 
giving people various awards, giving them spots on the program, yeah. giving them author meets critics. Yeah, those, those meetings, it seems to me, you know, so the way I see it, it's sort of, it starts at the level of the, of the sub-disciplines, right? So, so, you know, I work in, I do a lot of work in aesthetics. Somebody else does a lot of work in political philosophy. Now, within those dis- disciplines and sub-disciplines, there are also professional associations. So there's the American Society for Aesthetics, there's the British Society of Aesthetics. They have their own sort of disciplinary meetings, right? You know, where you'll go, all the papers will be on aesthetics or all the papers will be on, on something else. And, and then you have the sort of the, the larger infrastructure of, let's say, something like the APA, which is the American. I don't, and actually, I'm now thinking, I don't know if there's a British version of the APA or a, or a European. There's a British, British Philosophical Association and a Canadian one and an Australian one. Okay. Um, and then they're almost, it's at those meetings that you get a better sense of what the discipline as a whole is doing, right? I mean, in, in the sense that you get... You get you get sessions of across all the different disciplines uh, and sub disciplines, as well as kind of like you said, meeting professional meetings that have to do with the operating of the discipline. Um, 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 you know, what 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 are we going to prioritize in terms of whatever fi- funding we have available to us? Um, um, do do you see the APA or in, or institutions like that as as having a role to play with respect to? philosophy's fortunes more generally within the, so for example, one of the big things in the, today is, is the, um, the constant uh, jeopardy in which the humanities more generally seem to be in at universities, um, and philosophy is one of them. Um, do you see professional organizations like ours as having a role to play in trying to, in a sense, protect the discipline's place within uh, universities and colleges, et cetera? Absolutely. Uh, I think that um, that part of the APA's job is to promote the professional fortunes of philosophers. Uh, there are other things it does too, which apart from the meetings as well. Um, uh, but uh, the APA does engage in various projects that are intended to do this. So they have various funding for public outreach programs, uh, for innovative teaching programs, uh, I was a member of the Committee uh, for Public Philosophy at the APA, and it sponsors an op-ed contest to encourage philosophers to engage with the public. To do what we're they doing. Also, <laughs> yeah, to do what we're doing, but also, yeah. I mean, um, you know, uh, both op-eds you know, in, in papers like the New York Times or LA Times, uh, but also in small local venues or magazines and online, and online venues. So it does do some outreach. Uh, it also occasionally and on um, matters that are related to academia or to philosophy. So standing up, for example, for funding for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Is, they said, so they've taken a stand on that or signed on to letters that other professional organizations have also signed on to. Gotcha. To gotcha. So, it might, so let's say the, so the MLA... So if the MLA has put out a statement as something that has to do with arts and letters in the university, something the APA might join in, might do a joint statement, that sort of thing to try and is that yeah yeah that makes sense yeah. Right. Additionally, um, one one thing that um, t- took place while I was on the committee for public philosophy is uh, the creation of a, a letter that w- went out to philosophy programs, encouraging them to count outreach and public philosophy as part of the scholarship of a philosopher when um, considering tenure and promotion cases. So sometimes uh, outreach and public philosophy is considered service, and sometimes it fits more naturally under service. But uh, as we know, uh, when it comes to assessing a candidate, at many institutions, service takes a backseat to uh, teaching and to research. It's the least of the three. It's, it's, yeah. Right, in most places, right. Yeah. And so, uh, but there are some forms of, of public philosophy that, that do seem sort of like scholarship, like crafting a well-written and uh, serious op-ed or a chapter in a book that's meant for, for broader consumption. And the idea was that for those forms of uh, public philosophy that they, uh, 
departments should recognize those as scholarship, right? To take them more seriously. So that's a way of, of working within, you know, for directing a message to the institutions that are probably most interested in what the APA has to say in the philosophy departments to get them to in, also encourage. You know, we just, we just did that, Justin. Um, I, I actually just wrote a policy for our department to make, to set some criteria for when public philosophy should count towards the research uh, requirement. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, I think that it's given the, the changing nature of sort of communications and how we, how we put, how we put material out. Um, um, it has to be, done. it had to be done. Right. I mean, so much work now is being done in these sort of, nebulous me nebulous in the sense of we don't yet have categories for them uh a media that um it, something like that had to be done now i wrote the policy very conservatively so it wouldn't be abused right mm -hmm. uh, but i guess that as we get more comfortable as we sort of start settling in and start seeing what the landscape looks like now are, are you expecting that most departments are going to successfully move at least some plus public philosophy out of the service category and into the research category or are you skeptical I think that what do you see? What do you see? So, um, I, I think it'll happen on a. It, it's kind of going to be a case by case basis, depending on the, the type of project, right? So, uh, something like um, uh, making an appearance on a television show or something like that. You know, that's not going to be research or something. But, uh, at, but, but. Writing a, writing a chapter for a book that's meant for public consumption, it's probably more likely to make a case for that counting as research. Then there are these things in between. Uh, so uh, maybe you're developing a week-long philosophy summer program for underprivileged youths. And you're, you've been trained as a philosopher, you haven't been trained as someone who's going to teach underprivileged youth. So you actually have to do a fair amount of research about how to do that well, and then you write up something about what you've done to share maybe in a journal of education or something like that, or maybe in a, in a magazine even, or maybe online somewhere. And I mean, that's a case where was, the work that you had to do to, to, to make that form of outreach happen, your, your writing up about it might count as research. So not all public philosophy outreach efforts are going to count as research. Uh, yeah, not all public philosophy or outreach efforts are going to count as research, but, but some will. And I think departments more and more are – being friendly to that idea. Yeah. More and more of it. They're more familiar with it. I suspect that the higher pedigree places are going to be the ones most resistant to it, it seems to me. I didn't have very much of a fight on my hands at my university, I have to say. Um, um, but I suspect if I was at, if I was at Princeton, uh, I'd probably be having a, a harder time of it. Or do you think it's, it's not going to slice that way? I, I don't think it's – I'm not sure. You'd have to ask someone at a more of these institutions – uh, than mine. But my sense of things is that some of the um, these more elite institutions have been leaders when it comes to various forms of public philosophy and outreach. Uh, so, you mean like these MOOCs and stuff, or are you, are you thinking about something well, else? Yeah, MOOCs, but you also have, you know, some are like, so Pixie, which is, uh, I can't remember what the, what the acronym stands for, but basically it's a philosophy program for uh, I think college or pre-college students uh, from backgrounds that are not traditionally represented in philosophy, and they and and, and it's it's people from those places that have created and developed those kinds of pr programs. Um, it's the, I mean, many of the ones that I'm familiar with, I'm sure there 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 are many at various different institutions. Right. Um, but uh, I guess what I want to say is that. You know, those kinds of some, at least some of those kinds of programs have been developed by the very institutions, uh, the kind of institutions you had in mind just now. And I, I, they're not doing it um, for nothing. I would imagine uh, they're doing it because the department as a whole thinks it's a valuable endeavor worth supporting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm wondering what you think of this. I, my impression is that there's actually a tremendous hunger for public philosophy. Um, I don't think you can explain the absolutely insane rise of, of somebody like this Jordan Peterson fellow, um, mm -hmm. who I, you know, I don't particularly have much use for. But I'm more interested in the fact that he is so popular. Now, yes, part of it is because, you know, he's whistled, whistling to a bunch of, um, you know, sort of alt-right folks. 
But, you know, that doesn't explain why somebody would sit through, you know, six hours of Maps of Meaning lectures, right? I mean, or, or some other things. In, in other words, I, I almost am wondering whether we wildly underestimate actually how much how much taste there is for this kind of uh, stuff in the public. Um, um, uh, you know, the blogging heads folks told me some some dialogue I did with uh, with a, a gentleman on on Kant on Kant's ethics. No, no, it was Kant's. Excuse me, it was on the critique of pure reason. Mm-hmm. At something like twenty five thousand. You know, which you know, which for for a philosopher, you know, you're just like, holy crap, that's amazing, right? Is it your impression that actually we're kind of, to a great extent, underestimating the public, um, um, and that actually there's quite much more of a taste and desire for this sort of thing than maybe we give credit for? I think there is a, there is a taste for it. I'm not sure for underestimating it because one of the things that we should acknowledge is just how much public philosophy is out there. I think more so than at any period of time in the history of humanity. Could you give a sense have, of that, of your impression? Give me some... Give me some well, so, so, here, they, so, so there's this, the Stone, which is the column of the New York Times. So, so the leading paper of record in the United States has a regular philosophy column. Um, that is something that we did not have. Plus, they have a philosopher in the magazine section doing the ethicist. The LA Times has printed a number of op-eds from philosophers. Fortune magazine, oh, I'm sorry, is it Fortune or Forbes? One of those two. I cannot remember which one right now. Regularly, strangely to my view, publishes articles having to do with philosophy. Two publications I know of, Quartz, which is a large online magazine that's owned by the Atlantic Group, and the Irish Times have, philosoph- have journalists who have philosophy beats. Huh. Um, uh, I think they cover other things, but philosophy is in their beat. And both of those uh, publications have regular articles on philosophy. That's just some examples in news, right? Then look at the broader culture, right? You have blogs, more blogs. I follow so many philosophy blogs. It's part of my job running daily news is to sort of see what's going on. And so there are hundreds of philosophy is it blogs. Actually, is it actually hundreds? Uh, I probably follow around 150, but That's there are right. more that have, uh, you know, that are tiny, that don't get updated that often, or that, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, and there to varying degrees of activity, but yes, there's there's very many, because uh, some philosopher somewhere who you've never heard of will start a blog, right? And I, I, I there's, it's, there's no systematic way for me to catch all these things, but every once in a while, some link to something, or, and I'll add it to the list of websites I keep track of. Uh, so, so there's tons of philosophy blogs. If you look on uh, Quora or Reddit, there are various philosophy discussions going on there. If you um, look at, you know, beyond the internet to look at entertainment, entertainment is like, suffused with philosophy. Uh, I guess the most popular example of this would be that NBC sitcom, The Good Place, one of whose characters is a moral philosopher. And they've, you know, it's a silly show, in my opinion. You know, it's amusing. It's especially amusing for philosophers because the characters are referring to other philosophers. Yeah. Tim Scanlon uh, and his What We Owe to Each Other plays yeah. a significant role in the plot of that uh, sitcom, which is, is uh, uh, it's very surprising. It's very surprising. To see. Or, you know, anyway, so there's that. Uh, there was this other show... Um, that uh, I think was on HBO that featured a, a philosophy professor, another sitcom that was a former philosophy professor, who became a biology teacher, right? Then you have just philosophically interesting shows, um, Westworld, for example, which I think yeah. is one of the most interesting television shows ever made, is raises a variety of philosophical questions and isn't shy about it. Yeah. So uh, I think there's, there's really a lot of philosophy in the popular culture. Yeah, I think you're right. Last year, my philosophy department's philosophy club, pretty much their programming for the entire semester was every other week to watch to, to watch an episode of Black Mirror together and yeah. have philosophical discussions. Um, and I guess there's also these, even outside of universities, there are these philosophy cafes that have gotten pretty popular. Have you ever participated in any of those, uh, Justin? I have not participated in a philosophy cafe. Uh, a few years ago, we did have a film series, a philosophy and film series here at the University of South Carolina. 
and students and occasionally members of the public would come, we'd watch a movie and then we'd talk a little bit about it. There were different people in the philosophy department who were uh, invited for particular movies. Um, yeah. We've, we've done things like that. I haven't been to a Socrates cafe. Um, I, mean, I will say that there, there are also, um, in addition to the blogs, there's tons of podcasts as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and some of them are getting quite good. Uh, so you, you have uh, you, ones like this, which are conversations, uh, and others uh, that, are, that are more conversation-oriented, like um, Very Bad Wizards with uh, Tamara Summers. Uh, but uh, some are very high production now. So have you listened to Hi-Fi Nation? Uh, no, I've heard, of, I've heard of it, but I've not, you know, I don't get out as much as I'd like to. Um, why don't you say something about it quickly if you... Well, so this is put up together by Barry Lamb uh, at Vassar, and he just does a marvelous job of um, bringing philosophy into stories that people are already going to be interested in. Mm. Uh, and so he'll start off with something like, oh, there are these bizarre findings of about psychics when they were tested by scientists it turns out that psychics did an above average job self self-identified psychics did an above average job at identifying what was on the other side of a card that they couldn't they, they, they couldn't see right and so and so he, he starts off and he talks about that and interviews one of the one of the you know, alleged psychics, and, and you're like, I don't know where, the, I'm listening as a philosophy professor, I'm like, where's he going to go with this? Is it going to be like a right. mind thing? Is it you know, an epistemology thing? It turns out, brilliantly, it's the segue into the philosophy of statistics and scientific and um, uh. significance. It's brilliant. Uh, and the ways in which various values inform scientific methodology. Um, and so, but it's so compelling from start to finish. And then production-wise, it's, it's sort of like listening to like an NPR magazine show or something like that. It's just really good. Um, wow, that sounds really interesting. I'll I think like, like that's the next step for, for public outreach. Is that he's on the, I think, on the leading edge of producing something like that. Okay, so let me ask, I've set you up to ask you this. I mean, so we agree that there's really quite an interest in, in, in philosophical questions and, and, uh, there's quite a, a broad public interest, and, um, and that, that it's it's pretty manifest. Um, we also, though, at the same time, have to acknowledge sort of there is an ongoing narrative. Now, maybe you, you're going to tell me that you think that this isn't quite what it looks like, but my impression, at least, um, is that the humanities are in serious trouble in the university, and philosophy in particular. And, you know... Even if you chalk this up, let's say, in part to the introduction of too many market market like forces into the considerations of university administrators, um, 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 boards, etc. Given how popular philosophy is, um, that the, the market driven focus shouldn't 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 uh, shouldn't hurt it. So, a, do you think philosophy is in trouble? <coughs> In the university, excuse me, mm -hmm. and B, if so, why, given that it seems to be very popular uh, in, with the public? So I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, at Daily News, I've reported on way too many threats to the existence of philosophy departments. Yep. And sometimes the closure of philosophy departments. This typically happens at uh, smaller schools rather than big universities. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it seems like it's a worrying development. Of course, I'm reporting on philosophy closures, whether there are more closures in, say, French or um, anthropology, I couldn't say. Uh, I, I do feel, though, that there is this concern that, that humanities are undervalued, uh, in particular by um, concerned parents, by legislators and perhaps other stakeholders uh, in higher education. What explains this? Um, I think part of it is economic uncertainty. So one thing people don't know much about is what you can do with a philosophy degree. In fact, if there's one thing, if there's one joke about philosophy that everyone's heard is, uh, you know, what, what did the philosophy major ask? Uh, would you like fries with that? 
But, uh, <laughs> you know what? I haven't heard that one. That's no, good. Yeah, That's really good. For a really long time. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so the question is like, so what does one do with a philosophy degree? It, it seems like it's not a path to economic security. And for people who grew up during economically uncertain times, I think it's not unreasonable for them to steer away from uh, majors that they don't think they're going to be secure. Sure. Uh, like, I mean, at the same point, like the same, at the same time, business majors have increased, right? The number of business majors. So that fits along with that explanation. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I also feel that sometimes philosophy can be threatening uh, to certain people. I don't know how much that explains what's going on, but every once in a while you'll hear a story now, of course, I don't think I have a good example in mind. I, uh, I do, if you don't. So, go. <laughs> of, of, uh, well, what I have in mind is sort of a professor teaching a, a class or saying something, and it takes off the state legislator, and the state legislator then gets motivated to cut down yeah. the budget that goes to the state university. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Things like that. I'll give, like let that. me give you an example, okay? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this was really kind of shocking, but we actually saw our numbers decline right around the time that the God is not dead movie came out mm -hmm. because the movie exploded on evangelical social media mm -hmm. and our students draw heavily from the local South, South, South Midwest evangelical population. Right. I fought that. I had to fight that damn movie for years. Um, um, and um, I do think, and I've said this in comments and threads on the daily news um, that um, in states where you have um, particularly state legislatures that are heavily influenced by uh, sort of right-wing conservatives and stuff like that, the humanities are actually an object of a target of, of ideological uh, combat uh, at the state legislature level. Um, you know, we are constantly in jeopardy. Um, um, and it's right now the jeopardy typically is not outright closure. What they do is they merge you, mm -hmm. another department. In our case, we would get merged with political science. And then eventually that merger turns into a dis disappearing of your major. Now you only have a minor left. And then eventually you sort of just, you know, dissolve, right? Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right that there is some uh, ideological uh, opposition to the humanities that you get that are part of the broader so-called culture wars that we're in. Um, and that that in some states that plays much more heavily than others. Um, 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 you also have in red state well, country, right? You also have I think that that uh, that's that's a fair point, and that you also have state legislators who are looking to improve the economic prospects of their state, or at least appear as if they're doing so, and so they'll lobby on behalf of jobs, you know, education that trains people for jobs. So uh, engineering or nursing or more, like, certain other kinds of vocational uh, or science and technology, right? So we're, we're pushing in that direction because those mean jobs versus other stuff. It doesn't mean jobs. It's just thoughts. Mm -hmm. Who cares about that? That's not going to make us more money. I think it's short-sighted. I think a lot of it's pandering. And it's bizarre if you think of how if you get a lot of that pressure from, say, more conservative politicians who are, are more, perhaps more interested in pushing for market versus to have a larger role. I mean, another aspect to conservatism is treasuring our intellectual heritage. And so much of that philosophy represents. So maybe one thing philosophers should be doing in states where they feel that their legislators are threatening them from the right is to draw, is to, is, is to, um, draw more attention to the fact that they're the preservers of the intellectual traditions that conservatives allegedly uh, value. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although I have to say that I think in the age of Trump, that, that those conservatives are almost heterodox now within their, within the party. In other words, you know, it's hard to believe that something like closing of the American mind was, was came from the right. Right. Um, you know, you know, this sort of this sort of this in this in today, it's hard to imagine just because the right today seems so completely anti intellectual. It's hard to remember that it used to be the right that was making the case for 
right? Classical and humane studies, humane letters, all the sorts of things that they're, that at least their political ground troops now are so in opposition to. Right. Uh, Although we should be careful not to confuse like the popular identity, you know, the people who identify with, with certain politicians with what's going on intellectually behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, when Closing the American Mind came out, uh, was that like 1980 or something like that? <laughs> it was early. It was, yeah, it was during the Reagan. Right. But uh, when, when was Pat Buchanan wielding pitchforks about when to, you know, in, in a kind of very proto-Trump way? The culture war stuff? I think, that, wasn't that in the 92 or it, it, was when, it was when he won New Hampshire, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. So I feel like maybe there was some burgeoning of that going on, but um, but yeah, I, I, I do feel that I, I, we're we'll, we'll just be careful about romanticizing the past. The, the people maybe never were all that interested in ideas behind. Yeah, the I scenes didn't, I didn't mean really to do that so much as just to sort of say that it's almost hard to imagine now in the current climate. I get the sense that to the extent to which the sort of there are the sort of the conservative intellectuals, they're either marginalized or they're kind of sort of sort of hiding in a bunker until this is over so that they can come back out. I mean, it almost seems like. There's that, but I think there are some that, that have really come out. Um, but it's also that the conservatism has changed too. I mean, if you think of conservatism um, as somehow reacting to what's going on, to changes and, you know, what was it, uh, William F. Buckley standing athwart history yelling stop, right? Well, history is always changing. So what they're yelling stop at is always changing too. Yeah. And so conservatism changes with the times as well. And so who are people on the right today? They might look different from the conservatives from 20 years ago, and, the intel- and especially the conservative intellectuals. So yeah. uh, I think of people like, um, at least you know, the, the, some, some libertarians, right, share some overlap with conservatives and there, there are very many intellectually active um, libertarians who yeah. are defending libertarian views, uh, particularly like these bleeding heart libertarians, um, people like uh, Jason Brennan, uh, people like Jacob Levy. Uh, these folks are, are putting, then the Scannon Center is, has been developed to put forward libertarian intellectual ideas and critiques of our culture and politics from their point of view. And that's a relatively new development. I think it's really interesting. So, so there is, there's that. I I will say you you do get less of, uh, from what I can tell in philosophy, less of a defense of cultural conservatism and uh, or religiously motivated conservatism. But you get plenty of defenses of religion. There's some pretty, there's a pretty strong, Albeit small, but a pretty sm- strong network of Christian philosophers. It seems to me that are not that are not um, impotent within the discipline, um, um, and uh, that's correct. Um, I think I think are actually probably you know relatively respected, um, and some of them you know have done such such good work outside of the sort of religious sphere. I'm thinking of something like Plantinga, right? Um, um, that um, that never struck me as sort of being a problem. Um, let me ask you, just sort of as we're wrapping up, I mean, <clears throat> here's the sort of reason I asked you about philosophy's fortunes and about, about the situation and everything. It, it was in light of, sort of what we were talking about earlier when, when we were trying to characterize what philosophy is and what it does, both in the classroom and then in the research areas. <clears throat> I wonder whether we've, we've, in a sense, put ourselves in this position because, and I'm not blaming us for this, I think we were reacting as best we could to sort of external forces, but whether we're, we emphasize too much that philosophy is a skill set in the classroom, um, and the argument then can be made, oh, well, you can get that skill set in a lot of places. So one of the things that, that happens at our university that we're constantly doing is sort of, you know, fighting turf wars over the gen ed curriculum, right. over who gets to teach things like critical thinking, let's say. And you've got English departments and comm departments saying that, well, that we can do it just as well as you can, right? And in other words, do we make a mistake in not identifying philosophy more strongly with a subject matter rather than simp- with a distinctive subject matter rather than simply with a tool set such that now there's such a disconnect between what, what what's being done in the research and what's, what, we're, what, we're, what we're telling everyone at the, at the undergraduate university level, not just to the students, but sort of 
when we make arguments for why we should be in this part of the general ed curriculum or whether, in other words, I wonder whether we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot um, um, and made ourselves disposable, right? Or, well, replace, or replaceable. The phenomenon you describe about uh, the turf wars over who's teaching critical thinking, uh, an emphasis on or ethics. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's definitely there. Uh, in addition, there's some empirical research that I'm aware of that disappointingly doesn't show that one's choice of major affects one's capacity for critical thinking. You'd think that philosophy students would be better at that. The data, to the extent that I'm aware of it, does not show that. Uh, furthermore, critical thinking skills, uh, according to one study, don't really take in a student until after their second logic-like course. And it doesn't matter if that course is in a philosophy department or, say, in a math department or something like that either. So the empirical evidence to, to the degree that it exists does not appear to robustly support philosophy being uniquely well-suited to teach these things, but perhaps that's an opening for more careful empirical work, perhaps done by interdisciplinary teams that have philosophers on them. Uh, one promising note for such research is that philosophers, when engaged in certain kinds of empirical research, have done better than the traditional practitioners of that. So if you look at the uh, replication crisis in psychology, yeah. uh, if the percent, I mean, of course, there are a lot more results in psychology that are, have been not found to be replicable, but experimental philosophy, which could be described as philosophers taking up many of the tools of the social sciences when it comes to um, and doing opinion research and statistics and so on, um, they, they have no replication crisis. They've looked into it. Uh, people have looked into it. Turns out the results are fairly stellar compared to, to psychology as a whole. So maybe philosophers should get together with others and look into the actual empirical benefits that philosophers often tout. That said, right, whether we're doing it too much is, is kind of a, it's a strategy, almost a marketing question. And when um, we're confronted with some of that, I, I sort of want to say, ask the experts. We don't ever ask marketers, what should, how should philosophers package themselves to today's students, right? But it's not clear that we shouldn't be doing that. I, these people sell stuff to our students all the time, right? If we're interested in selling philosophy to them, I feel that they probably have certain forms of expertise or inside knowledge that, uh, that we should be paying attention to. Uh, it's normal for us to tout the skills because we want students to think that it's worthwhile to take a philosophy class, even if it's not what they're going to end up studying. Right? On the other hand, I think that you know, we do risk losing that distinctive uh, subject matter emphasis that might attract uh, some students and also point to philosophy special value. What is the, makes the most sense as a strategy for philosophy department? It's hard to say. So it sounds to me like you're a little ambivalent, or at least you're not yet settled. I mean, my inclination has been to sort of increasingly emphasize the, 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 the distinctive subject matter over the tool set. In other, in other words, you know, if you asked, if, you know, if an undergraduate or someone, an administrator asked me to make a case for why philosophy should remain in the curriculum, I'd give a very similar kind of answer as to why a history should remain in the curriculum, and that is that you know there is a there there is a sort of a, a, an ongoing uh, a long standing narrative across a number of distinctive subject areas uh, in questions that you need to know in order to be able to participate in your civilization right um, um, and that without it you really you you are ignorant in a way that makes it very hard to function um, um, productively uh, both as a citizen uh, and even as a private person. Um, um, that this is, you know, in, in other words, I, I guess I, I want, I'm inclined to try to make a case for philosophy that's not rep, that's, that, that, that renders it not replaceable uh, by something else. But it seems like you're hesitant to, to go. Well, like, I, I do worry that what you just said is falsifiable I and mean, falsified. Um, there, there are plenty of people who get on just fine in society not knowing anything about philosophy and don't feel uh, embarrassed 
or intimidated by their lack of knowledge because most of the people they're interacting with are similarly situated. They're doing just fine, right? You could say the same for history, though, couldn't you? I mean, you I mean, so what answer do you give to why should history be in the curriculum? If not an answer like the one I gave, what answer do you give? Um, well, so, so, well, I mean, I, when I, I don't have to answer for, for history uh, usually, but to, to say something about, I think probably along the lines of what you're getting at when it comes to philosophy, is that philosophy takes up certain questions that other disciplines tend not to about understanding ourselves, understanding our beliefs, um, understanding our world. And it's just that other disciplines, and some people often define philosophy this way as the kinds of questions that are left over from other disciplines. But, but we ask kinds of questions that, at least at present time, do not seem settleable by appeals to science or technology or history or tradition or literature or the arts, right? We have a, a certain set of questions here. Uh, and we can point to what those questions are. Like what, when we say that something is true, what do we mean, right? Or what, what does it mean to know something? We are the ones who are asking those kinds of questions. Um, and So you are inclined to go a little bit towards the direction of, hey, there is a distinctive and unique subject matter here. It's not just a tool set of critical analysis, reflective, you know, reflective equilibrium or consciousness. I mean, you are inclined to say, no, there is a distinctive subject matter here. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's, there's no doubt overlap. There are ways in which other disciplines approach these kinds of subjects, but there's our tradition here in Anglo-American philosophy in the early 21st century is, and has inherited a certain mode of inquiry from and a certain subject matter from people who've done this kind of work before and have called themselves philosophers. And we're a part of that tradition. And and insofar as it, it, it while it may have fuzzy boundaries and it may in some sense be historically arbitrary and who gets to count as a philosopher and what kind of work gets to count as philosophy, nonetheless, it there is a fuzzy bounded body of inquiry there that we're engaged in. Right, right, right. Well, uh, I think we've, we've gone through all the stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, is there, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to bring up or something that, that, that we've left hanging. Um, is, was there anything else that – was there something we missed or was there something that we did that you weren't satisfied with how we <laughs> closed it? No, it's fine. I, I am, I'm a bit surprised that the, the topic of, uh, say, academic freedom – on um, campus didn't come up because that's something we often uh, discuss on the website, but we don't have to do that. Yeah, you know? Yeah, I, I was hoping that it wouldn't be the last conversation I ever had with you. Um, um, uh, and so, you know, I might, I might ask you in the future to do some other things that are on more specific, but I really did want to get a sense because you published this blog that really is one of the key sort of insider blogs of the profession to talk to you just about what its current state is um, um, and, and where we are in the university, you know, where I am, our concerns are almost entirely existential, Justin, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's whether we're going to be here next year. It's as basic as that. And so mm -hmm. that's my, my main focus now. And some of the other things maybe are more interesting to, to people that are, are in departments that aren't in as much jeopardy. But you right. know, we're, bar we're barely able to repl you know hire you know replace retirements. You know, half our department now are either adjuncts or instructors, um, and so that's why this is in the front of my brain right now. Um, sure, academic freedom is important. Um, um, and other I, think, I think job security is a, is a huge issue. I think providing uh, secure employment for people with graduate degrees in philosophy is important. Um, so, and, and those are those are pressing concerns, and I think conceivably uh, we all could be doing more in regards to them. And yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things that you know is at the edges of what we're talking about, which you just brought up, uh, and and you know we could maybe talk about it another time is you know the extent to which the fortunes of philosophy suffer. You now have a secondary question of okay, what are we going to do with all these damn PhDs we're producing, right? And there certainly is an argument, and I've made it very publicly, that I think, given the current situation, that we ought to be very seriously questioning how much PhDs we produce. I've suggested in various places that I think there should be a moratorium. Um, you know, I, I, I'm now finally getting to replace a retiree, a retirement from three years ago. And, 
you know, so I'm gearing up to chair my fourth or fifth search committee. And I'll tell you, for our little place, we get almost 300 applicants for a job. Right. Now, that tells me there's a serious problem. I mean, in, in terms of a way oversupply. So you've got, you know, you look at the mixture of that 300 people who are applying. Yeah. I suppose. A whole bunch of them are people who have just been in the wilderness now for years. Mm -hmm. so they've racked up, you know, long list of publications applying for junior assistant positions. And then we've got freshly minted PhDs with, with, you know, with CVs that are this big. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all in the same pot. Right, um, which which strikes me as a serious uh, situation uh, that 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 maybe um, the professional association needs to be more involved in. But I didn't want to get into sort of, I didn't want to start, you know, sniping at people's. Stuff. I want to get more sense of you of the lay of the land, where you see things are in broad terms. Well, if I could say one last yeah, thing about you the land, like. yeah, please about, about the lay of the land. So I think that philosophy as a whole is in a pretty interesting time, right? If we putting to one side some of these kinds of professional problems about the future of the humanities and job security and so on. If you look at what's going on in mainstream Anglo-American philosophy, uh, you have an enormous growth in a, in a number of ways. So for one thing, this longstanding cultural divide between continental and analytic philosophy, which has been eroding since probably 1990 or before even, um, has, I think, really become much, much less significant. And you have much more talking across those boundaries, much more taking up by analytic philosophers, the kinds of questions continental philosophers thought were important, much more you know, in interaction, and much less even discussion of that divide. I think that's great. Um, culturally, right, we're, we're talking now about philosophy in different parts of the world. That yeah, non-Western, yeah. Yeah, in philosophers from, yeah, from non other parts of the world who um, we hadn't considered as worthwhile historical figures or we hadn't taken measures to include in our contemporary philosophical discourse. And we're learning, I think, from that. There are all, all sorts of new developments, and I think we're probably just at the tip of the iceberg from what we're going to learn from bringing new perspectives into philosophy. So you think, you think we're currently we may be in a situation of transition rather than one of decline. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, tr I, I would say, I'm, I'm, I think it's great the kinds of changes that we're going, uh, undergoing. Leave, again, leaving aside questions about you know, job security. And no, but they may be related. I mean, if you're right, those fortunes may turn around, right, as we go through the transformation. Right, but just to focus, on, on, I guess, on, on the, what, what's going on when philosophers are, are doing philosophy, um, you know, increased bringing into account of the empirical uh, and, and various um, uh, findings from, from social sciences, I think, is another way in, in which philosophy is developing and growing. So I, I feel that uh, we're becoming much broader minded. Right? I think we were, for a long time, we were sort of trapped in this model that our professors inherited from their professors. Right? So I'm like two generations away from Rawls. Uh, in my, you know, philosophical genealogy. And, uh, you know, if you look at the 1950s, 1960s, when they, those guys were getting started, it was philosophy in, in the United States and England was this thing that white guys did in seminar rooms, and it was very limited. And what we've seen, I think, gradually for a while, and then I think probably since, you know, for the last 15 or so years, really explode is an increase in who gets to do philosophy, who counts as a philosopher, what kinds of philosophy we're going to listen to and hear from and learn from. And I think all that holds out a lot of promise for interesting things in the future of philosophy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> now that you said that, we can now, I can now go on with you for an hour and hour, but another hour and probably argue with you. You know, one of the things I was going to say is that, you know, in, I agree in the broad terms. You know, so I just had Brian Van Norden on not long mm -hmm. ago talking about his book about, Asian philosophy. And, um, um, you know, I have to say, you know, that, that, that sort of puzzles me in terms of the resistance only because at least in my case, our Asian philosophy course is very popular. Um, mm -hmm. and it's one of the courses that routinely draws a lot from outside the department. In other words, not just majors, um, all the sort of global studies kids and all these other sort of things, you know, um, um, are quite drawn to it. And so, you know, we hire for it. 
our last hire we hired for it because it's not a course we're, we, we're willing to give up. It's, it's, it's a, a moneymaker. So as they say, yeah. um, and, and I, I have, I have a difficult time believing that we're some unusual outlier in this regard. Um, um, especially certainly you'd expect at a place like where I am for it to, to be not popular if it was going to not be popular anywhere. Um, you know, so on the one hand, I kind of agree with you in the sense that it seems pretty clear that that kind of broadening um, is going to uh, may really improve our fortunes if we can, but if we can, but uh, continue with it. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, when you said like what you said about you know white guys and being able to do philosophy, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe I was just educated in a really unique way. But gosh, I mean, my undergraduate and graduate education was full of women philosophers very strong figures going back to the 50s. And, and, and I actually think you could argue that the women philosophers from those bad old days are much more impressive than the current ones. I mean, there are no Anscombs walking around, right? There are no Philip of Foots walking around, in my opinion, at least. And I wondered more generally whether you think I'm under the impression that we're now in a, seri- a situation where we're not really quite replacing with quality with quality. I, I, I almost feel like with the generation of Davidson and Putnam, with that generation going, we're not we're, we're not we're not replacing with people of the same caliber. It seems to me, or is that just wrong? So I think this is an area over which we'll disagree. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's just let me see if I can take what I think might be the the least controversial. A response. Yeah, give me your version. What that, you see? That statist- statistically, what you've said about women professors, women philosophers, is very unlikely to be true, right? So you think there are Anscombs walking around? Well, People that's that another quality. Agreement. It's not clear to me that the fact that there that were there fewer Anscombs walking around that would be bad for philosophy. I'm not a huge Anscombe fan, but I, but just leaving that aside, right? No, I think we have more and better philosophers existing today than than ever before in the history of humanity. Okay, uh, that's interesting. If you, if you take, like, you know, take up the broad, say, 20-year period up leading up to now, right? You got to take a significant amount of time, right? But, um, and, and when they strike us, when we look around, like, where are the hands cones, if you want to use hands Or whoever, the Hillary right. Putnams or whoever, right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, two things have happened, right? Uh, that allow uh, two things, right? One is the filter of history has sort of cleared the landscape. And what remains from that era are Ah. identifiable figures who we've dealt with and thought worth considering for a while. Two, We're forgetting about all the rubbish that walked around at the same time as Anscombe. Is what that, that often happens when we think about the past, right? Because what we remember is the stuff that others have deemed worth remembering. Right. The other thing is that the level of philosophical quality has probably risen such that they're, that it's harder and harder to stand out, mm. right? But that doesn't mean that people aren't doing work on par with what these other thinkers have done. It just means that more and more people are doing that. And it's just harder. It's just... As we all get better. It gets Each person's harder. carrying a smaller piece, sort of what you're well, saying. It's not that we, we, I mean, maybe, maybe I want to say that there are hundreds of people like Hillary Putnam doing philosophy in the United States today. It's just that uh, we don't notice them because there are a hundred of them. They're not sticking out. I mean, if you look at if you're a fan of technical analytic philosophy, I mean, it's unclear that what's going on today is – uh, worse than what was going. I mean, it, there's a level of sophistication and, and, and depth that you have going on now that was quite rare in the past, yeah. right? And then when it comes to women philosophers in particular, I mean, this well, the last year you had um, Kate Mann's book Down Girl come out, and I think this is probably going to that book is probably going to be one of the most significant books of the decade when it comes to philosophy. What's interesting about it is that, as you've said, we've had women philosophers to work for a while, um, but nonetheless, there's something new in this book, right? Something new that's based on consideration of the lived experiences that women have undergone, including the author, and then that material is taken, and the best tools of contemporary Anglo-American philosophy are then put to work on looking at that experience and seeing what we can learn from it philosophically, right? So um, what's new is that here is that, okay, here's this phenomenon. 
the people who experienced, she was able to put a name on this, to develop it in a philosophically sophisticated way. Um, why now? Why didn't this happen 20 years ago? Why didn't this happen 40 years ago? Um, maybe there wasn't enough people doing, women doing philosophy then. Maybe the kinds of expectations about what counted as philosophically serious topics didn't include what makes women's lives different from men's in certain ways, generally speaking, right? So as we, I think as we bring in new perspectives, new people who have different kinds of experiences, and as the kinds of questions that confront their kinds of lives come to be taken seriously by philosophers, we're going to get more and more interesting kinds of philosophy. Well, that is certainly interesting, and, and um, I see the argument. You know, I, I also see where I would go, you know, this does to me connect back to the question about that arc I described about how long and how much it's fruitful to pursue a philosophical question. And maybe part of my reason for thinking that uh, we're in a period of dwarfs relative to relative giants is because maybe I'm, maybe I'm inclined to think that some of these things are being now beaten to death to the point to which the, the discussions really aren't that productive or interesting anymore. And the, and the fine grain is getting so fine grain that it, it's going to the point to where beyond what I think is philosophically interesting. But I mean, that's, that's you know, obviously highly disputable. And, um, and in other words, I almost could see two versions, two stories about this, yours and mine, that we could, we could have a really interesting argument about. And maybe when after this piece comes out in philosophy now, where I kind of make this case somewhat substantially, we can talk again um, um, because I do think that there's a lot of interesting areas there um, um, about what we're doing, about, you know, uh, who we look up to, about how we, you know, how, how we think of the, the future next generations of the discipline and so on and so forth. But uh, today what I want to do is to sort of get an overview from somebody who really does, is connected in the sense that you really are paying attention to what's going on in the profession in a way that somebody like me just isn't. I mean, I don't, you know, I have my little slice of it and all of that. And so um, uh, it's very useful uh, to hear your perspective. Um, and um, I, I greatly appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's very nice to you. It was a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, it was the same here, and um, uh, I will be asking you to supply links um, to all of some of the things that we talked about, some of the things, whatever you think is interesting. Okay. Some of those blogs, you're talking about that incredible podcast that you described, which uh, mm -hmm. sounds really fantastic, all that sort of thing. Uh, thank you very much, Justin Weinberg, and I hope to talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you. Right. Take, Take care. care.